heavy smoke they were attacked the shells from the uh, cruiser land on uh, bengal bengal's one of the compartments uh, gets hit but they are able to uh, continue engaging and when the smoke clears one of the merchant cruisers gets sunk and the other one was nowhere to be seen it later of course reached japan and this is unparalleled you know there is a temple bell in new zealand which talks about indian connection there when we find it and we talk about it it just cements the fact that we have been connected uh, sanjeev talks about criss crossing the oceans it's been part of the indian uh, story will we be mindful of our geography and look in directions and not be with due apologies be delhi centric Namaste to all the viewers that have joined us today. Today is a special day on two counts. Firstly, Mahashivratri, so Sangam Talks wishes you all warmly. Another is the last war of independence, nineteen forty-six, a tale of the naval mutiny within the Royal Indian Navy, and other chronicled in his book Timeless Wake: The Royal Indian Navy in World War Two. We have with us Commodore Johnson Odakalji, an Indian Navy veteran. whose father was in the royal indian navy and a fellow mutineer in the british jargon he is presently also a certified behavioral analyst and consultant dr johnson is the founder and ceo of johnson and duckel initiatives an enterprise that empowers students and young professionals in domains of knowledge growth life navigation and career guidance i warmly welcome you sir thank you very much for gracing our platform and i would request you to take over from here thank you ajaswi thanks to sangam talks Uh, Tanya, you, the entire team, greetings, Jai Hind, and uh, multiple greetings, uh, greetings on Mahashivratri. Also, greetings. In fact, can I say a special tribute? Uh, this is seventy-seven years to the date when, in nineteen forty-six, on the same day, the Royal Indian Navy ratings, which included my father, in then. HMIS Talwar, now the barracks or the Talwar barracks where the naval transport pool is, and I remember Sanjeev Sanyal and me standing outside trying to figure out what all was there, and we did have a look at the places. We also went to now what is the naval barracks, the castle barracks where my father was incarcerated. So very special in a in a way. I am getting this over in the beginning because yesterday I was talking something about it, and I became a bit. emotional so uh, that's not where we are that's not the story today but we will talk about it and uh, what my plan is to begin with uh, a bit of the back story uh, the what i would call the why and the how so uh, and then uh, share about briefly uh, i am catering for about 45 to 50 minutes uh, an overview of what is very less known that india and rather indians contributed to the allied success in the naval theaters and that's the story of this and then but i will end with how is it significant today so let me begin with the why and the how and the images on the screen are very very precious to me okay so you have uh, the top image uh, which has the then governor keshankar narayan not no there uh, admiral shekhar sena but very important on the right is this amazing legend of india vice admiral manohar prahlad avati no more he went for his permanent sailing to the yonder world um, in november of 2018 and uh, he is the one who in a way initiated me into the journey uh, in this whole setup now when i write the book timeless wake i was not part of the maritime history society i had presented some papers and then we have this uh, fantastic idea that uh, if you are in a job you are an expert okay that's that's how we place it so i had written a paper and the next year say you wrote a paper last year go and present a paper again so i did 
then comes you have written two papers now you are an expert so we had uh, uh, commander mohan narayan who used to be the curator he kind of was after me uh, to write the book uh, admiral natkani was also responsible but then uh, admiral natkani was the one who really encouraged but admiral auti was the storyteller the the person with enthusiasm the one who would give me inputs and the other person someone who's uh, 20 days older than admiral auti is the baba of timeless wake and that's the gentleman sitting in the center in the lower photograph okay mohammad odakal master from kondoti malappuram and that itself i i will not talk of family legacy i can go in a whole hour on that but he is the one who told me the story first time when i was a 7 year old some of those stories so that's kind of lived with me and yes i am not talking of the uprising immediately so he was there at this book release on navy day 2013 which made me an author and so because i have written a book now i am an expert on that now uh, you know jokes apart uh, i am so grateful to the indian navy i am so grateful to the uh, maritime veterans uh, and today i am part of the veteran community for having the opportunity so how did i write so when i got to writing the book there were two books already on the subject that means what was the royal indian navy doing in world war one and world war 2 specifically world war 2 what could i add because one was edited by visheshwar prasad and it was written by instructor lefn collins and there was another written by the royal indian navy officers association uh, uh, commander uh, hastings and uh, so i said th- there is no point in just repeating the same and that made me unpack the story i examined every single incident from the idea of cross reference and double repeat that means unless i found two independent sources corroborating i didn't put it so in that sense this is a completely new book and even as it is going to it's 10 years since the book was written i feel i have maybe some fuel in the tank to rewrite it in a different approach altogether now with the learnings of this year but that's to the end and so i started writing i was given 2 years a year and a half later i realized i am not happy because i ran out of my archives i didn't have any content then i requested the navy well you're giving me some some token honorarium to write the book it's a pittance i won't talk about it but the honor is greater than the uh, honorarium and uh, i found there was no content left and then i found content at the national maritime museum greenwich and i said okay will you allow me to go abroad i was a serving officer i'll spend the money and there was a wonderful uh, commander in chief of western naval command admiral basin and he says no why are you going to spend your money we will fund you and that made me uh, uh, enjoy a 20 day trip to greenwich an amazing place uh, that again is part of the stories that i tell and i could dig through so many archives including indians who had written and indian newspapers and so uh i am i'm happy about the book and a lot of people are proud about the book but for me it's something i treasure a lot so when i'm sharing the story it's i'm also encouraging that you know it is possible and today i encourage people to speak and to write so that's where the book the why and the how of the book because i think that's pretty important but today uh i am uh, as i share this next visual the upper half and uh, this is a, a modified slide from what i used to talk about and i have written 1950 to 2001 so what happened on uh, at independence by the way we didn't have indian navy it was still called the royal indian navy it was only on 25th of january 1950 that the union jack the british uh, flag went down for the last time uh, and uh, uh, then the uh, they, they that had gone down rather the ensign the uh, white ensign from royal navy uh, went down for the last time and on the morning of 26 january 1950 the indian naval ensign went up and that was the design as it was 
that time. The naval ensign has gone through a few design uh, changes. And last year, in, on 2nd September 2022, the Honorable Prime Minister un unveiled for all of us the new naval ensign. And that itself is a story. How is that special? That's also part of the journey of the 75 years of Indian independence, the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, and uh, which I was a part of writing uh, some of the accounts and also uh, making, helping uh, script a documentary. So today that is there. So it was not just a change from the prefix of royal or dropping the prefix, but it was a sign of coming of age of a Navy, of a journey, which is much older, which is what my next part of what I'm going to tell about is. So this story is the first half of the 20th century. Okay, so this is 100 years, uh, of, uh, about a century later. Now, I have on the top left an artist rendition of Lothal. My personal study is it might be very different from what the artist has rendered. And I have a feeling we are still piecing together pieces, uh, whether that was a pond, a dock, uh, there were port operations, the uh, geology was different because there were earthquakes after that. But the truth is Lothal was at the hub of significant maritime activity and trade from West Western Northwest part of India, and I'm talking only coast, by the way. I'm not talking of Pashtuns and those areas, the landmass. Uh, but from Gujarat, trade to Oman, to Mesopotamia, to East Africa, and I have a feeling even to Madagascar. It was not one route, but multiple routes. At some stage, uh, by the 12th century, uh, it is now recorded, whether you hear Sanjeev, uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, whether you hear Shashi Taru talk about pulling down, uh, and he loves pulling down the colonial components, and many other authors talk about it. We had a sway over the maritime domain. When Cholas get sick of Indian ships being pirated and the authorities to be in what is the Vijayanagar Empire not taking action, he launches a naval expedition. So we, we have this notion that India is, you know, a very peaceful country and we don't attack. I'm sorry, when we are threatened, we, we attack. Okay, we don't attack because we have annexation designs, but to preserve good order and peace. And in that, we would not ever hesitate. And I think that kind of remains. So that was the medieval part. Unfortunately, that millennium of naval influence goes down because we our sea-mindedness, our maritime consciousness dips and we allow European powers with their focus on their maritime prowess to literally overrun India. But they came from the sea. This colonization, this attack did not come through the Himalayas or the Northwest. Those who came went back. But these guys came and stayed on. However, the naval infrastructure and the force that they built is still a part of our history and a legacy. It, we can't detach ourselves because in form and structure, the Indian Navy did start. Today, 75 years later, we are doing a lot of review and changing some things that are not relevant in our context. That's a part. So in the turn to the 20th century, the names change quite a lot. We in between had an Indian Navy also as a term, but you have the Royal Indian Marine. And that is how uh, in 1892, uh, that's the force that uh, gets ready when World War I happens. So I'm not spending time on World War I, but I would love to share a story of World War I. And that's the story of the Suez. Now it's a little dated now, uh, but some people might know of the evergreen ship that got stuck in the Suez. And for nearly a month, how everybody uh, was uh, in panic. Because imagine, before, what did Suez do? It shortened the distance between Europe or rather the Western Hemisphere and India uh, to, so that they don't have to sail all the way around the African continent. So we saw what could happen. And during the World War, 
World War I, which is called the Great War. At one stage, Germany, which was in ascendancy, and Baron Wolfenstein, uh, he is an advisor to the Turkish military. And there is an offensive by Turkey literally threatening to slice the Suez into two. And who goes to defend Suez? The troops that go are from the 62 Punjab, part of the 11 and 12 Indian Division. They are the ones who are finally stationed. And who goes to provide the gunfire support, the naval gunfire support among the ships? It was HMIS Hardinge, whose gun crew were Indians. So even in this, where, uh, and it, it, the battle is, unfortunately, we don't have too many details, but what little I could piece together, uh, the attack was repulsed and Suez remained. Hardinge continued to operate over there. And there were three other ships, Northbrook, uh, Dufferin, uh, and, and, and the four total ships. They acquitted themselves with glory. They continued doing patrols in the Gulf, uh, in, in uh, East Africa, in that segment. But unfortunately, uh, as soon as the war got over, the past to be decided, uh, the Indian waters didn't need a full-time navy. And this is against the advice of the admirals who were in command. And they felt that the Indian waters needed a residential navy. There were many committees. Uh, and today I don't want to share much. I normally talk a lot about that. They all recommended. There was a nine-year plan. There was a Chatfield committee report that there must be a, a full-fledged navy. And... Uh, they almost signed the bill to have a Royal Indian Navy. It got it lost uh, the vote in the central legislature by one vote. But finally, on 2nd of October 1934, the Royal Indian Navy was commissioned at what today is the, uh, the dockyard dispensary in the naval dockyard in Mumbai. Uh, it's over there. And then the later, there was a whole parade in what is presently the Brabon Stadium region. And that was when a dedicated, there was a flag officer commanding the Royal Indian Navy. It had just a few ships. Uh, and that is 1934. And that, la that decade, the middle of the 1930s, uh, heading towards 39, uh, the world was heading into a turmoil. All the plan that and the enthusiasm with which the League of Nations had been formed did not seem to be successful. Um, Many parts of what would be colonial Britain, uh, there were uprisings, there were movements. India by then had, and I think now uh, when the book Revolutionaries is talking about both the armed action and the unarmed action, all components were part of we need to have a sovereign independence and uh, be our own. We come out of the dominion status that was there. In that element, Europe was in a turmoil. And that delicate balance of power was uh, not happening, uh, falling apart. And finally, you know about uh, Hitler marching into Poland. Uh, and then Lord Linlikto, the Viceroy of India, just unilaterally declared India is at war. Now, initially, of course, there was huge protest. How can you, uh, you know, uh, declare? Because there was some kind of political power already transferred through certain institutions uh, however effective or ineffective they would have been. Uh, but very soon, very surprisingly, the leaders of the political component of the independence movement supported participation of India in the world war. And I think their aim was very clear. They knew independence is around the corner. I mean, that kind of everyone knew. The only challenge was the date. And I'll talk about date later. So they felt uh, you need battle experience. And you can't create a battle, though, you know, people do try to create battles, okay? But I don't want to go into conspiracy theories here. But the fact is, they wanted that experience. And so that is what, you know, as soon as the war got declared, these were the five ships of the Royal Indian Navy, which were out on patrol within the first month, fully ready for battle into, into the Gulf and into... Uh, the Gulf of Aden and the Persian or Arabian Gulf, depending on how you call it. And uh, just note these, this, these were the ships, old sloops. And if you notice some names, 
Uh, let me just quickly flash. Uh, I know this. Those watching on the mobile, the text may be small. Clive, Cornwallis, and Indus were nearly two decades old. These ships were about to be decommissioned, and so if I show you back, they were not. We didn't. We're not going to have a navy, and what little navy we had was going to be, uh, you know, reduced to half. So this reduction, rationalization, which is a new good name for reduction, uh, was was on it. Was at hand, and yet when the battle comes, the oldest ships were the first out on battle. and they equated themselves with real valor and glory so that's one thing one of my early points in uh, conveying through this uh, through this narrative is investment in a navy we talk of gdp and we talk of investment in infrastructure you know when you invest in a navy you are investing at least four decades of the nation's history to come because it takes time to design a ship it takes time to build a ship it takes time to operationalize a ship and then the ship serves design wise maybe 20 years but we know of enough ships 30 years 40 years i mean they they live a, so do you know the amount of investment the number of people the legacies the traditions the practices the prowess they built that is what is investing and that's that's my aim i mean even before i start the story and and that is it. so my first story i i would i'm not sharing many stories but uh, just enough for you to probably get the book um, so but uh, before the story this is the slide of pride for me and i wish i may be given time and maybe one of my future interns can help me make a better graphic so i have started becoming lazy my energy of a few decades back is not the same but i this is what i've tried this is a map of the naval india at that time and these bullets indicate where all indians were during the world war look at the span from the north atlantic to singapore straits from madagascar to the arakans operating extensively in the persian gulf in the red sea action in south indian ocean and leading anti submarine forces in the mediterranean i mean it's impressive it's and there were people these were the people who planned the navy of nascent india so even if it was before our independence fact is we were operating and it was a legacy of what we were operating uh, many many years ago uh, years earlier uh, we were operating in many parts uh china has hired uh, storytellers like gavin menezes to artificially create stories as if zanga invented the whole world and you know populated the whole world that, that's that's totally a story uh admiral arun prakash talks a lot about you know that uh, in, in the books that were written but for us today when genetics are analyzed of new you know, the aborigines in uh, australia people find there are genetic roots to indian uh, connection so uh, you uh, th there are two stories one uh, see uh, conditions were different people could have walked across but the reality is it was more of a maritime connectivity so uh, that's the span of the theaters so let let's just cover uh, one of them and that's my i call the fascinating story of they said this is in in the words of admiral uh, krishnan an hour of battle a medal forever so what's the story so young neelkant krishnan uh, uh, was uh, was on this ship and uh, he he writes you know neelkant krishnan admiral krishnan is a very fascinating uh, uh, character um, and arjun his son has written a lot i'm just opening the uh, the story in my but so he, he, he the whole books uh, a sailor story uh captures the uh, the whole account i'll get okay the bottom line is even sardar panikar got the story wrong and he he wrote the story admiral krishnan killed the admiral of uh, iranian navy that's not true okay uh, he killed uh, he was involved in a landing operation or rather a boarding party which is a small uh, troop of people and he was heading 
and he had his uh, he had a petty officer and he had a small team of sailors and they go out on a on a small craft sail up and there are three persian gunboats now he is a regular naval officer but the story is a story like a commando operation okay and he enters from one hatch drops in a grenade for uh, goes down and he has a pistol in his hand and from from in front of him the commanding officer the captain of the gunboat comes and literally like some western cowboy movies he shoots and uh, the uh, captain's uh, the other guy's uh, bullet just whizzes past krishnan and his bullet hits him so he actually says later uh, i mean i would it, i could have been just a story and so that is that is the amazing uh, story of neelkant krishnan uh you can read more in uh, the sailor story you can read a bit more on uh, in the in timeless wake and he was awarded the distinguished service cross for that so this is battle experience this is not uh, something you get trained for to do an operation and that's that's just kind of not all there is another story of uh, evacuation of uh, an indian contingent that was stuck in berbera which is in the northern part of the somalian uh, you know the horn uh, you can probably see it in the map uh, berbera is where the gulf is written a little below that now italy part of the oriental force had overrun berbera and as i said the indian contingent had been taken captive so hms convalis had was deployed and now there is young bhaskar suman another famous admiral later uh, to head the navy and bhaskar soman and a tall brit petty officer john eckersley a company they didn't want noise so they had a motor boat but they decided to row all the way to the shore and after they row they come across and you know what they find the italian contingent is fast asleep so without firing a shot they kind of capture and so they surrendered but they won't share where the indian contingent was uh, kept so uh, then uh, soman and uh, eckersley exchange some notes and eckersley just becomes all aggressive captures one of the italian sailors takes him behind the wall and a uh, few minutes later a gunshot is heard now they he comes back all you know sweating and his and, um, eyes red and he goes and soman points, points to the next guy and he catches him and they start singing they, they literally share everything and nobody had been shot that was just a ruse that they had been that plan so you know these things happen in war these are not what you plan for these are not tactics you discuss these are these are things that experience in war and of course uh, they went on to th- there is a story later told about capture of a submarine and and other stuff Now I want to jump forward to July of 1943. So this is Operation Husky. So let me let me just backtrack a bit. By this time, 41, 42, the uh, flag officer commanding uh, Royal Indian Navy, the East, the CNC East, they realized that uh, they had to equip and strengthen the naval forces. around the indian waters and those who were deployed in the east so two three things were done a they armed a lot of merchantmen they took up what today is called stuffed ships taken up from trade uh, they fitted guns and that's where the naval dockyard became quite handy and they uh, fitted the uh, anti aircraft guns uh, they also decided to commission uh, six ships uh, from england and uh, they were uh, they were commissioned uh, there were six uh, uh, sloops of what is called the satluj and the jamna class and they sailed all the way from uh, atlantic but they couldn't directly sail so what was done is they were deployed into the north atlantic fleet to gain the battle experience and what is called uh, the uh, what is called the workup we call the operational sea training today we have the navy or uh, the navy has a whole uh, uh, organization to for preparing people for combat readiness so that's that's where uh, satluj and jamna are two of the sloops that uh, come to india 
and as soon as they come and they finish the indian uh, feminization they are then deployed okay so they are deployed now, operation husky if you have read anything about world war 2 Uh, was a plan for allied forces to recapture the continent by launching an uh, uh, attack on sicily and to land troops in that launch uh, uh, in, in that whole uh, operation satluj was made the head of the anti submarine forces and so they were the first ones to have what is called the asdic and asdic is the earlier version of what is sonar okay by which you can detect underwater threats and so satluj and jamna were were deployed uh, satluj was head of the anti submarine forces and they remained deployed in the mediterranean for quite some time so in the allied forces people you know we are still uh, at times struggle to enhance uh, our anti submarine effectiveness Uh, enough defense writers bemoan about the slow growth of the submarine forces or the anti-submarine operations, but the fact is that realization comes because we gained that experience in that kind of operation in 1943. Half an hour done. My next story is this lovely story of what I call the Bengal bravery, and I call it the David versus Goliath story. And allow me to spend a bit of a time. this is chapter 10 in my book um incidentally the story is not mentioned in the first account of the royal indian navy in world war vishesh's prasad book conveniently skips it i have no idea why why he skips it but if you come to chapter 10 of the book uh, that is the uh, story of the bengal bravery so what is this uh, story all about well as i said the plan was to strengthen the forces the royal indian navy uh, one part comes much later but uh, uh, the earlier part was that they decided to get bathurst class mine shippers that's a particular class of mine shippers uh, built from australia and they would sail all the way from fremantle which is uh, the cricket lovers will know it as perth it's near perth and they were to be sailed to india so one of the teams was it was uh, the sailing of um, uh, hms bengal the crew had been sent to um, australia and in the very first sailing they were get, given a battle task to escort ondina which was a merchant ship all the way to diego garcia so that that they sail in uh, november and on 11th of november midway in central south indian ocean they encountered two japanese armed merchant cruisers the size of bengal was 650 tons the cruisers were 8000 tons and 10000 tons so i'm not just talking of a weight difference but they were bigger they were sturdier they had more resilience they had um, uh better armament but here is a story and this is one of my work they they encounter uh, they they find a little ahead this and they clearly knew that this is not one of their uh, vessels and uh, so they uh, bengal then takes action bengal asks pondina to fly off and head towards colombo uh or move away but ondina doesn't go away and that turned out to be a wise decision bengal refrained from firing its guns because it had a range disadvantage at one stage the first of the japanese cruisers fires at bengal bengal still holds fire and only when it came in range it started firing and uh, uh, the the commanding officer uh in his uh, story when he is uh, writing okay he shares a story in his what is what we call the letter of proceedings uh the story of uh, heavy smoke they were attacked the shells from the uh, cruiser land on uh, bengal bengal's uh, uh, um, one of the compartments gets hit but they are able to uh, continue engaging and when the smoke clears 
one of the merchant cruisers get sunk and the other one was nowhere to be seen it later of course reached japan and this is unparalleled so it is uh, it's almost like the biblical account of david versus goliath or any of the accounts you can see bengal literally uh, uh, then ondina proceeds independently to diego garcia bengal literally limps back to colombo uh, it is received with great honor with great pride the gun crew of uh, bengal comprising of uh, pk nair steward balachandra um, ragnath sone ismail baba mohammad khan mohammad kareem uh, they were mentioned in dispatches um uh, it were awards were literally handed out and when they come to bombay finally there is a public reception of for bengal it's one of those receptions there was a parade there was like a battle uh, honors provided bengal by the way doesn't spend much time repairs are completed and it proceeds to singapore to um, uh, continue part of the anti submarine operations um uh, i have spent a little time on sharing the bengal story because to me that's it that's fascinating as it can get um and that's what is naval action i come to what would be the uh, last of the direct uh, battle discussions or stories that i will do but this will again take a bit longer and that is the burma operations from 1943 to 1945 so japan had earlier tasted success in the early part of the 20th century uh, unfortunately it was not on the winner side uh, uh, could not sustain that post world war 1 but it builds up and is called the imperial japan navy the ijn literally overrun step by step all along east asia and comes through singapore attacking andamans attacking uh, now what is called myanmar till we have the battle of kohima so the japanese jeopardy that's the title of uh, what i have written about that operation reaches a stage where the royal indian navy is forced to think laterally and differently and that begins the start of the royal indian navy's landing craft October of 1942 uh, this is what later we would call the amphibious operations which is where uh, it's a uh, both the armor uh, army operations and the naval operations come together and in today with air cover it's the classic tri service operation uh, the landing craft wing is created why is it very interesting my father joins 1944 the landing craft wing a few years later of course he was not Uh, in uh, myanmar uh, he he was of course heading when japan surrendered by 1943 the 55 motor launch flotilla uh, did significant operations and here is interesting indian forces had been involved in burma operations even 100 years ago when uh, during the earlier time uh, when the company was in power and there were marines which were deployed and there were operations held uh, in the area of arakan or in the area of west myanmar uh, something like the west coast of india it's more than rivers you have these creeks but they call them chuangs and it's very easy to hide and ambush uh, any um, approaching uh, vessel or a uh, patrol vessel and so it requires a different level of skills and young lieutenants young petty officers were involved they continue operations through the next season after monsoon from october 43 to may 44 finally they reach arakan and what is shown on the right is from an extract i found at uh, national maritime museum it's five navies fight the battle the royal australian navy the royal south african navy uh, the royal navy the royal indian navy and uh, there was one more and they come together in multiple ways finally this what the red uh, like veins is indicated on the map that was a different operations finally ending with rangoon falling to the royal indian navy on 2nd of may 1945 and that's where rangoon gets captured and uh, burma is back with the allied forces so that's where 
uh, I I want to kind of pause the main story, but I'm not done. I still have got a little bit of the story left, which is when in 2013, I uh, when the book was published and I wrote, my closing chapter was what is called a living legacy. The first part is what is called geography. Now, India or the Indian geography is unique when you look at the Indian Ocean. It's a peninsular region. It's a peninsular geography. We are aware in the formation of India, in the uh, geological history of India, a piece of land broke off from Gondwana in the southwest and literally sailed all the way up and crashes into the Eurasian plate. And that forms the Indian geography. So um, that, is, that is the most dominating feature. Now, many people talk about Indian Ocean as if it's India's ocean. I want to correct that. It is not India's ocean. It was never known as Indian Ocean till the 16th century. And we didn't have this concept of kind of claiming territory and naming it. But in a lot of writings, especially a lot of Greek writings, or I think, um, yeah, it was as a Oceanicus de Indicus. That's how the name comes. Because everything east of Suez or everything east of the Red Sea was India. That is how it was there. And that's, that's common in many stories. But the fact is, if you look at the Indian Ocean geography, the Indian Peninsula is the most dominating feature. And what does it give? It gives us an ability to see 270 degrees. You can, most of us see west, but you can see south where you go all the way down to Antarctica. And east, which has been a cultural and commercial and later now contested connects. Are we mindful as for geography? How many times do we realize we travel all the way to Kanyakumari? We look at Swami Vivekan on the rock. Do we know that there is a sea beyond it? I mean, we, we stop at Andamans and there are a lot of stories about I mean, Andaman and strategy. There's much more beyond it. And I'm very grateful at some stage we said, act, uh, look east and then we made it act east. And I said, why just stop there? Act ocean. Act east, south and west. We suffered because we took our eyes over the ocean. Though we never stopped sailing. By the way, Indians never stopped sailing. Even when edicts and were made and Samudra Langan was talked about, Indians continued to sail. Will we be mindful of our geography? Today, from Indian Ocean, we say Indo-Pacific. That's not new in Indian context. You know, there is a temple bell in New Zealand which talks about Indian connection there. So when we, when we find it, uh, and we talk about it, it just cements the fact that we have been connected. Uh, Sanjeev talks about crisscrossing the oceans. It's been part of the Indian uh, story. Will we be mindful of our geography and look in directions and not be, with due apologies, be Delhi-centric? Okay, it's not that attacks only op happened from Himalayas. We really lost our freedom from sea. The next is uh, seafaring culture. And I call this three combinations of blood, muscle, and brain. No seafarer has become a seafarer without shedding blood or straining his muscle. And when I mean, let's talk a story of how people would sail. One of the first tasks, globally, this is a story, uh, a ship would come into port, some people would visit, and you know they would have a drink at a tavern, and they would be hijacked. And next you wake up in the morning, you are at sea and you're pulling ropes. Well, that's a Western story. Fact is, Indians, uh, Indians have a different story. We operated our stories of sailing with the lunar cycle and tide to tide, spring tide to spring tide. Uh, the ship would be brought in at high tide. Uh, repairs would be completed. The cargo would be loaded. And when the high water would come, sweat and blood would be put. It would be pulled out to sea and they would sail. They would come back after one or two tidal cycles. Sardar Panikar writes a whole paper on tides in ancient India. So there is a quantum of skill and effort and takes years to be a good seafarer. Uh, even as we talk, we have Abhilash Tomi all set to round the Cape of 
on and you know what all he's been through some of us who are following the story we kind of feel anxious um i don't know share my stories of storms and rescues by coast guard and stuff but the sea is a tough place but it's also a place with brain and in the indian nautical story and i'll talk about this and you should be mindful of time is that you have to apply your head to succeed and not the nautical heads because at sea heads means the toilet okay we are crazy people we always name things the other way around okay so uh, but blood muscle and brain which means skill research study education that will bring seafaring culture um recently we were at bhubaneswar and that's where this possibility of the sangam talk actually first birth and the uh, indian navy along with the ministry of culture and he was involved we uh, uh, the project for stitch ship was announced because there will be some merit in the technology and the concept of ship building in the past everything is not about nails and welding uh, we are talking of composites and others so seafaring culture is a lot and i will say spectrum of operations you know blue water operations world war 2 we saw blue water operations but you also have a praise for brown water operations that means the coast needs to be protected to prevent a 2611 but are you aware now there is a movement to green water operations which means not we are not going into any algae laden water okay this is the concept of sustainable sea based activity there are garbage patches in the ocean there are pollutants which are literally threatening to kill the planet so the movement from operations to ship building to autonomous the whole aim is to make it uh, environment friendly and green technology and not it become a common term but i call it the green uh, green spectrum of operations and the last bit i want to talk about is what we should always start with what why and how why do we need a navy in the first place why do we need to be a maritime power in the first place why do i need to pour in so much money why can't i just be happy with transporting stuff because we are a maritime nation our survival you know yesterday i was talking uh, in my uh, my own personal faith system or we talk of the indian cultural core life began at sea the first avatar is from the ocean uh, the opening lines in the bible talks about chaos and the spirit of god hovering over the waters in whatever way you talk the sea is that samudra manthan is not just about some ratnas coming out it's the knowledge of churn when you um, operate deeply and research into the domain of the ocean of knowledge there is a need for education i mean mainstream education has challenge we are talking of ocean sector this is what i wrote in 2013 i want to believe it is still valid today 10 years down the line and so with that uh, allow me to just kind of go off the story and uh, share a bit of what i am doing and how i believe i can be of value to it so i i want to uh, i would have ended the story here the maritime world has myriad hues you you know and in the ocean i found some of the most beautiful sights in my life both above water and under water there are multiple frames you don't have one frame of reference there are many frames of reference there are many learnings it's impossible for anyone to call themselves a maritime expert impossible you cannot unless you are god yourself okay only the divine has that complete sampurna gyan okay none of us have i just feel i was a couple of years ago on the verge of writing another eight books sanjeev sanyal and a good friend and i know i quoted him a lot keeps firing me why are not writing i don't have the bandwidth to write because you know when you come to culture heritage education you need a source of income you need a team you need a complete infrastructure you cannot write as uh, old man in the sea by ernest hemingway even when another good friend amish writes you know there are some he writes but he writes with a team i mean you, it, it's uh, so uh, i suddenly i am feeling a lot of work which is half done you know i am actually making a appeal can someone take the stories that i have half written the projects that i have half done and is there a setup that can take i know the indian knowledge systems is uh, doing it 
uh, I spent six years at Maritime History Society because a crazy admiral asked a crazy Commodore to come and be a part and we both spent madness. I did things which were unthinkable. I offended a lot of people, but we delivered. I mean, uh, that is today a fame. Today, a lot of work is not done. So what have I done thereafter? So let me not be, this be a litany of woes. This is what I do today. Okay, today I coach, I communicate, and I guide others to proper careers. Okay, what is coaching? It's all to say that you have a compass within you. And in the Indian context, by the way, that's a favorite compass of mine, but in the Indian context, we have heard of the Matsi Yantra. Okay, it's a, a very unique idea. Do we have a voice? Are we able to express a voice? Can we write well? And I believe everyone can write. Everyone can speak. It's a learnable skill. And that's the other thing that I do. And careers. Uh, one line from my career guidance. Skills that are top on demand today. The careers which are the top careers in the world didn't exist 10 years ago. The same thing is there in the maritime domain. You know, if you are a blockchain expert, if you are an environmental um, professional, you will do very well in the maritime domain because the sea has dead zones which are without oxygen. There, you need to address it. There are garbage patches larger than the size of France in the ocean. If you don't touch it, see a climate change. Yesterday, I read today's morning newspaper across India yesterday was late March like temperatures. And that's because the sea balances have been altered and that uh, is saying. I have been very fortunate in the year and a half since I uh, superannuated from the Navy. I've run into a lot of people, including when I was with the Disha series of tops at Bhubaneswar, across from interns working with me. Even right now, I have three interns who are so adorable. They, they just love to study and I, I'm, I just enjoy being with them. I am so grateful because of what the country invested in me over 39 years. I can do that. But I want to feel that my battery can still be charged and I can still contribute. So I want to end back with Timeless Wake, which is to say, pursue knowledge, pursue growth, pursue life. If you feel I can be a part of your journey to help you find your timeless wake, then please mail me. I'll just ask you one quick question. That is, uh, can you take us through the naval revolt of 1946 through the lens of your father, oh, yeah. especially his reaction to the discharge certificate by the Royal Navy? <laughs> You 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 stolen the real crux of it. Okay, let me very briefly uh, share this. What my father used to tell, you know, he was not very spiteful uh, on some of the things. He said, no, while the war was on, uh, the camaraderie was amazing. A lot of these young British officers would spend time. And uh, the, uh, my pet name, uh, by some people, I have many pet names. So uh, the some people call me Johnny. But uh, Johnny was a word for basically any young soldier or sailor. So I said, Johnny, come here and I'll show you this. You know, the same guy. I said, the moment war ended, something happened. They stopped being friendly. And one of the problems could be that they were homesick. The uh, discharge bureaucracy was horrible. You know, it took eight, nine months for someone to be deboarded, to just be, and then be able to go back. Plus, food started deteriorating. The Patli dal. Uh, there's a good line in the Navy called Dal Dal Kichal, you know, and, and some stale bread and, and many things. It reached a stage where one side, there was this zeal for independence. We are heading towards our own power. And you have these, sorry for a word, Gora is trying to tell us what to do and not. And so angst was building up internally and also externally. And uh, my father is a young um, 19 year old okay so he says the impetuousness of youth and uh, uh, he also took part I mean, he was not one of those famous names uh, he took part and uh, finally uh, I'm not going to go political because that will really rile me up but he felt very disappointed when the political leadership let them down and finally he was incarcerated in castle barracks they were tried and summarily discharged and then he has this story you know this he always says Four of them would be marched and he was given a certificate discharged with disgrace from his majesty's service. And I have to say this in Malayalam. He took 
none in the paper you know it basically here take your paper they tear up the paper and throw it back at the officer and they walk out and i have written in my book no paper could take away their honor and pride and the legacy with which they served thankfully all were not foolish like you know acts like what my dad would do and of course he went on to do a lot uh, that's one part i have to be careful about that genetics but there were others who learned from the journey and the experience not just the uprising but also the whole journey and they crafted the navy of modern india because they were young lieutenant commanders and commanders who could then envisage and design uh, what would happen and uh, how the navy that's why they planned ahead that india needs submarines india needs an aircraft carrier uh, india needs to build amphibious capability india needs to build its own ships you know the, these are some of those legacies i know i've gone beyond what you asked but my father used to be when i used to tell him stories later he used to be so proud of uh, you know sir so at when when the book is released and he comes and he meets the governor you you can see him kind of relishing just you know some decades ago he was in the uh, you know locker incarcerated in the cell and here a place of honor but that's what our nation is it doesn't matter where you have been uh your value does come out uh, later and that's that's what i remember about him and his stories uh, thank you for that sir uh, i couldn't help myself but have more questions for you sir uh, sir sarojini naidu's poem uh, gift of india talks a lot about inglorious deaths of indian infantry uh, but uh, was that lack of regard even true for the naval indian personnel uh, in the in terms of their participation in world war 2 uh maybe i wouldn't call it a direct connection but in terms of writings on the naval mutiny or uprising uh, how we reworded the phrase is definitely thinner the closest we get is sadir uh, sahir ludhanvi's uh, poem kiska lahu bah kon mara uh, which there is also a version that it was also of the partition related angst which is all happening in fact the only writings are by participants or by friends of participants in literature or mainstream writing including those who dealt with uh, maritime matters uh, there is uh, practically no writing about the inspiration in some way what my father used to say and partly true they were forgotten it is only towards uh, 1999 Uh, i remember when the naval uprising memorial in cooperage in india in uh, bombay uh, was set up uh, the cnc admiral pasicha uh, was there when that was commissioned and uh, later there were others uh, adam bhagwat talks about insurrection they there are writing and suddenly from 2000 i find there is that zeal to write after timeless wake came out i have had about a dozen requests can you share something about the uprising of course now we have a lot of writing Dr. Anirudh Deshpande has written. It's from his thesis. Pramod Kapoor has written a fascinating book. Of course, Sanjeev Sanyal alludes to it, and many other people. There was a work of art by uh, Shekhar Krishnan and uh, uh, Vivan Sundaram. Uh, I wrote last year in Economic and Political Weekly. Today, I, I kind of just reposted it. So there was there suddenly a move, and we are just waiting for a film to be made. so we did try uh, you know uh, do a short film uh, of about 15 minutes with a lot of help so that is it uh ojaswi there's a direct question come to me from my friend kamdo ajay uh, he kind of asked can you briefly touch upon the role played by indigenous merchant shipping in world war 2 uh so that's right thanks ajay for the question uh, right in the beginning uh, this is both they played a role both by direct participation and also as support operations so the direct participation is a number of merchant vessels smaller were taken up and retrofitted with guns and others and they were used mainly in patrolling uh, and uh, uh, naval defense duties uh, instead of uh, putting the mainstream ships but uh, there is less record except for what we find indirectly so many uh, indians on in the merchant navy died during the world war 2 uh, there is uh, in in masjid bandar in uh, by the way that's where sanjeev and i really became friends 
in in a heavy rain we were looking for this memorial to indian sailors who lost their lives in world war 1 and 2 so there it's just a record unfortunately we do not have too many writings of what specific role was played by a particular ship what i have understood is there was definitely intelligence sharing uh, later we have this whole uh, organization called the naval controller of shipping organization ncso and uh, where uh, indians who are on merchant ships especially the indian registered ones do have a training and they do share information so they are in a way like the eyes and ears we do know that in certain other countries uh, context uh, merchant vessel may not be merchant vessel they may be just registered but they could just be operated by militia uh, we i am very clear we don't have anything like that all our uh, registration operations are above board so uh indian is merchant ship did part but unfortunately i do not have more literature or readings beyond uh just the fact that many of them were involved so one more question would be uh, what were the ramifications of india being deprived of the industrial revolution so like in terms of uh, you know ship building how competent were our ships because most of them i think weren't steel ships yes so the story of ship building is another uh, very uh, uh, a glorious component of india's maritime history uh, for many reasons uh, we had different even today when if you go across the coast of india from uh, river rukmati in mandvi to say chaliam in bepur to um, i met this amazing person bhubaneswar even in bengal and many other places the catamarans which are built and uh, the the uh, different kind of design so there is an in, uh, indigenous tradition which is very suitable to the particular geography to the particular water body and how it would be do most of it if there is a surfing it it allows uh, technically there is a very interesting word you know if you studied archimedes principle we know the idea of buoyancy so very common for a steel ship you, you it has to be buoyant so even if it is steel the total buoyancy but you know india had the tradition of a seep through that means water would seep through so when a boat would be made of reeds it is not waterproof water allows but its uh, technique allowed it there was still place for with the buoyancy for the cabin to be above water and that would still allow operation not not all of them so uh, and there are experiments in that regard but specifically to your question uh when uh, wadias uh, lasaruji uh, uh, rajin nasarunjari wadia uh, became a master builder uh, ship builder at the naval dockyard it was still wooden ships being built and you are right and i have written that the industrial revolution kind of is not uh, the benefits don't come to india because that's exactly by when colonization is completely happened but the foundries in naval dockyard were operated by indians so even today when it come to lining the boilers of a steam ship where there are steam ships that's a craft which is very and plus i've seen uh, when it comes to cast iron and fittings uh, whether you use covers of a sewage line or anything anything to do with cast iron india still retains but you are right it would take a long time till the sindhya ship building yard in visakhapatnam or later the pno line becomes the masdocks masgaon ship builders before that becomes the main uh method of ship building we were a little late to the journey in ship building thankfully the naval planners were very clear that indigenous ship building so both with the mainstream ship building as well as the naval defense shipyards the effort towards what we today call as atmanirbharta has been a part of our tradition of our design but i believe there's a long way to go so we did miss the industrial revolution but i think industrial revolution 4 and 5 very much are on our side and when it comes to ai blockchain technology composites green shipping uh we are going to rock the world and i am not saying it lightly uh we have the necessary focus uh, iit kharagpur was always looking at some of the elements uh, iit chennai looks at ocean engineering and there are a lot of others uh you know navy has been uh, naval indigenous and innovation organization if i get the right a good friend komodo gulaya is looking after it and that's how to bring the indian uh, entrepreneurs and thinkers and engineers on it 
so we may have had those challenges of delay but i think we are well on track to see that uh, we are not the leaders in ship building today but in the maritime india vision 2030 does talk about we moving to well within not just the top 10 but the top few uh, in ship building in india uh sir uh, uh, there is often this uh, tendency in within the indian army and all its three pillars that there is this connection we have with history that predates organi- organized army so if you see the sikh regiment uh, i remember seeing you know statues of maharaja ranjit singh everywhere and uh, that's the same with chhatrapati shivaji and the marathas so um, how does the indian navy connect itself with the very rich maritime history that you talk about like the chola the good part of it we may not have advertised this much but we were always mindful but today it's happening in a very institutional manner so we always called our two maratha admirals we use that word but i don't think they would love to be called that that is admiral avti and admiral nadkarni because both were from maharashtra i mean that's just a coincidence i think they were very pan indian they were very a uh, very focused and very global citizens who were indians that's because i've 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 spent hours with talking to them one of the things both were very clear on is reading i mean reading history is the most important but reading and they were well aware and they would really debate with you if it did not match what they read and i am one of the fortunate ones who had debated with both and had one or two victories not many i mean just one or two i, I have places that i have i have a kind of had a conversation with them what they had done is that led to an initiative called the maritime history society being birthed that led to the effort today what we are doing is we have realized okay we have been referencing too many pieces of literature from other sources when there is awareness and need of very much can i say indian ocean sources let me be more just than indian because i think there was nothing we were a very interconnected ocean community a uh, lot of traditions when we talk of siddhis who really challenge the thing they are from abyssinia okay uh, we call of the roman connect to um, uh, muzuris so we were very pan indian ocean community so in that tradition and reading so i can give you a very specific example the brits would have you believe i have to be very frank the admiralty would have you believe that navigation was invented by them by 16th century and you could find longitude only when the chronometer was invented and when i i i got riled so i launched a project called uh, taking on the work of very illustrious late professor arnachalam who had done a lot of work on indian sea heritage and navigation uh, how the cholas navigated across uh, with parallel sailing and how the pothis were written and built and i put across i'm sorry it's one of the pieces that is lying in dust because it requires phenomenal funding it requires a team so whether it is the old ship building methods the compass how did we use our knowledge you know if we can make a janam kundali with the exact patri and the position of the stars i am sure we could locate the star and get the position out of it so the knowledge is not unfortunately we haven't recorded it as well as some other people who have borrowed we call it the arabic numerals no numbers were invented by india transported to arab taken over this and now they, they someone else teaches us mathematics we were the original inventors of maths so if we had knowledge of maths we had knowledge of astronomy we had knowledge of geography why would we not have knowledge of navigation so that's my quest i've been looking for geographers i've been looking for vedic scholars i've been looking for some because i can't do it i'm be very honest it's it requires too much but i can facilitate it because i'm a very uh, you know passionate navigator i do that for life and life. so coming back today there is an endeavor so when professor gantri shastri i talk in the indian knowledge system i mean he is interested but then he also has to manage the budget so you know so if if we can get this together we'll have some of these and then tradition wise the idea of good order at sea was done by cholas practically the idea of strategic vision shivaji's navy wasn't large enough 
but he is the one who envisioned it is sarkhel kanoji angre who finally in 1699 he is made the admiral who finally gets more wins even though uh, shivaji himself had a very clear maritime vision we forget about the kunjali marakars ordinary boatmen and traders for 100 years didn't allow the portuguese to without prior approval of the samudri to even step on the malabar coast so this is a tradition and so the smallest piece of work which i'm hoping to do maybe with not with just about a little support is uh, maritime governance through cholas kunjalis and angres you know i hope that uh, we can kind of but it, it, all these require you know like you can't sail a ship alone except crazy people like dilip donde and you know uh, abilash tomi but uh, and they also are doing it because there's a whole team there's a whole village supporting from background if we do that then some of these we can do and then the traditions which are indian and indian in nature can be ones which drive us in our thinking along with we are very inclusive when we say vasudev kutumbo we take learning from anywhere we don't have a problem in learning from anyone but we don't have somebody dictating to us ki look you are wrong and this is how it is that that we have a problem uh, the way sometimes uh, the foreign minister kind of you know gives it back that's exactly how you know because you have to study first the first is like you saying uh, that's what sanjeev sanyal also says in his book land of seven rivers that we were not good at very good at documenting it we, the map building the map making was more that the westerners did uh, so i want to know that we were we had such a rich history of travel where did this concept of sat samundar par or not going sat samundar par or the concept of malay a different race which speaks a different language come come in and how did it get so well entrenched here that's my first question tell me your second you have already asked about four questions in that so it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> the Go second ahead. is i would like you to elaborate about the naval revolt okay on the second ojasvi please plan a full session on the naval report i mean that uh, uh, because no there are people who written more than me and studied more than me on the revolt my story is a bit more of uh, some newspapers and my father's account but honestly people like pramod have done a lot more investigation uh, and others are there so my information is dated uh, all i would say is there were multiple what i've said in chapter 15 of my book there were multiple factors and more than just uh, anything else it could have been avoided but it was the last nail on the coffin and when the revolt got over at least on record to say very few people know that india was to gain independence only by june 1948 they literally panicked and maybe it must have caused some harm also because things like the radcliffe line happened because someone just decides to take a pen and draw a line and things Oh, and and the chaos that it creates, but it did rile them enough to say, "Now we can't manage. We can't." So that's all that I will share. The factors were not all political. The factors were more of a clear biases and discrimination. Once the war, war has a tendency to unite. Once the factor of war got over, then the real colors start coming out, and angst was building up. But there were some people who tipped the. uh boat who kind of facilitated with uh, collaborative action from so there are those two versions one it was just nothing it was just a uh, angst one it was a very planned movement and honestly for me as a researcher i would take both ends and i think it's a mix of them to be frank that's on the naval revolt but i think there are more experts who can share more but let me let me uh, definitely talk two different things when it comes to maps and documentation it is not that we did not have maps we didn't have the cartographic maps that we see today which definitely in the global community portuguese are one of the early ones who did it in the manner that they write but we did have maps our maps were representational if you see kachi certain paintings and uh, in in my office when i was at mhs i had a map it is very representative you have an approximate idea and it gives information if you travel in this direction you will reach here if you travel in this direction so it's not the map that you would see on today's gps because one thing you have to understand the earth is a spheroid and when you represent it on a flat surface distortion happens 
and you have different projectors uh, you know mnemonic projections mercator projections which talk of how the distortions would happen and that's one of the challenges plus information so we did have representation and some of those maps are old they definitely predate the portuguese uh, cartographic maps which came to india that is very clear even documenting there are pothis but a they were written in a very strange language like the pothis of lakshadweep were written in what is called arabo malayalam written in arabic script but with a lot of mix of malayalam and other thing and similarly in kutch and other places because uh, i'll give another example uh, a lot of the bible or the old testament is written by the rabbis the uh, writers and they would not leave a punctuation mark between the words because only the expert would be able to read it so there has to be some knowledge hidden similarly this is written in a very similar style so you need and it's only when um, people like uh, uh, his name will come in a minute uh, i'll ask my the thing when the pothis were uh, ashok rajshirke who knows about five languages he has uh, done decrypting and he wrote the first set of book uh, then at mhs that was published and then we found a set of pothis which were about to be sold internationally and then we managed to retrieve paid money we paid money to get it and that's being uh, translated uh, and the, so that shows there were writings unfortunately our aim was gyan batna nahi hai gyan chhipana hai i mean because if you shared knowledge you lost power so let's let's face it we were a hierarchical society for good or bad we are hierarchical so the varna system and i'm not getting into caste i'm saying so the information chain so that information didn't kind of go down but on the question where i use a word subaltern the malich or the that part so do you know who operated the boats the malla the boatman let me take you back to ramayan when you know lord ram has to cross and the malla comes there is a challenge you know there is a whole story because the ordinary work is done by the ordinary in the hierarchy and i am not even talking of any religiosity here i am just saying the one who is the ordinary so the who is crazy enough to go into the sea in the first place the one who has the money and i he'll make others do you know i will sit on the throne and others will go whether is fighting the battle whether it is sailing whether it are the others so the fishermen community and the sailing community were lower in the order of hierarchy and as long as it suited and they were sailing and money was coming in as okay but you know there is a difference here it's not all the way i'm sharing right from the 10th century onwards there is stories of maybe even earlier i think it's not directly written but even maybe 3rd century bc they were priests who were traveling on ship because ships were cultural voyages not just commercial voyages they were definitely not military voyages in the beginning and so the priest so the whole idea of avalokiteshvara you know this defender the salvation so that's how this uh, idea of an imagery comes on top so those are to say there was a connection uh between admiral avti who would always ask why did we uh, have this idea of uh, samudra longan uh, so sanjeev sanya's premise is uh, the mercantile world provided a lot of money and the temples were the venture capitalists and when some of those attacks started happening much in the 11th 12th and 13th century they found that uh, you know and plus the risks of sailing it was not worth it so how do you stop some work being done issue a fatwa you know make it religious you know you want a work to be done make it religious you don't want something to be done put a proscription so there is the, this is again a hypothesis this is not we don't know the actual answer the fact is sailing was discouraged and definitely sailing by the caste the higher caste or the ones was i have a feeling it's more of the risk factors the venture the return on investment and so when indians vacated actively crossing the seas the arabs come in the chinese come in and then the friendly westerners come in and when they come in they don't let anyone operate unfortunately in our mindset it hasn't changed the seafarer is still the subaltern of the indian economy 
only the ship owner is the real royal uh, today when i was a young uh, cadet and i sailed my first trip it was a royal trip i i kind of i am going to write a book on it called seascapes today even indian seafarers in indian ports are unable to get off the ship because the process has become so difficult they are back to being subaltern so i think it's somehow it will take maybe a lifetime or a whole couple of generations before we realize seafaring is something that should be natural to us should be a part of us uh, thankfully the government is providing some incentive but i have to be a little harsh whether it's the government whether it is the ministry whether it is some of the top you know the real people who do the sailing the real people who do the studying the real people who do the work are still the lower end of the food chain they are not the ones so we have a different system i know that's a long answer someone but when we we still it is improved at least where there is a sea mindedness but a lot more needs to be traversed so that brings us to the end of the question answer session thank you very much johnson uh, ji for this very 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 insightful uh, session that we've had it has really opened several perspectives and many dimensions and uh, sort of given us many different notions about the indian navy that only leaves us uh, hungry for more so about that session i'm definitely going to contact you to have a second session on the on the revolt thank you very much happy shivratri to all uh, thank you sir thank you. namaste thank you.